you know, you occasionally learn something interesting on Facebook. Once I saw a guy on a bridge about to jump, I said, don't do it. He said, nobody loves me. I said, God loves you. Do you believe in God? He said, yes. I said, are you a Christian or a Jew? He said, Christian. I said, me too. Protestant or Catholic? Protestant, he said. Me too. What franchise? He said, Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? He said, Northern Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? He said, <clears throat> Northern Conservative Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region or Northern Conservative Baptist Eastern Region? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. He said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. I said, die heretic, and I pushed him off the bridge. <laughs> I told my wife that story and she was horrified. And I told Pastor Clive Nash and his wife Monica was standing there. Clive laughed and she was horrified too. Maybe it's a boy's story, not a girl's story. But as I thought about that story, I realized there was a great truth in it. A truth that I've experienced in our own church. I do want to tell you a little story here. I notice there's one kid down the front, but he's busy anyway. You might enjoy this story. <clears throat> It's 100 years old this year, 1921. David and Sire flood from Sweden and uh, their friends, the Ericsons, decided that they wanted to become missionaries to Africa. They planned to go to a village. I don't know how they discovered this village, but the village of Indolera. So they prepared for the trip and they took the journey and when they arrived, having gone so far, all the way from Northern Europe, down there to Africa, when they got to the village, the chief would not let them enter for fear of alienating the local gods. So the couples were forced to travel a little further up into the hills and build themselves a mud hut away from the village up the slope. They stayed there for some time, suffering all kinds of difficulties, malaria and uh, the like, and they found the going fairly hard. After a time, the Ericsons became so discouraged that they packed up and went back to Sweden. Saya and David stayed on. She managed to influence one local boy for, for Jesus. He came to faith. This was, this was the boy who had been bringing them food. I don't know whether he was giving them the food or whether they were buying the food, but they had contact with this one boy and he became a believer. Saya fell pregnant and she had a difficult delivery. When the village chief heard about her difficulty, he relented from his negative attitude and permitted one of the village midwives to go and give her some help. She gave birth to a baby girl, but sadly, the mother, Saya, died 17 days later. Her husband, David, was filled with grief, so grief-stricken that he lost all confidence in God. He lost his mission, sense of calling, and he decided to pack up and go home. He took his things, including his newborn baby daughter, travelled down the mountain to mission headquarters, left the baby with the missionaries there and returned home alone. I can't imagine doing such a thing, but there you are, he did. He went back to Sweden, remarried, had four more kids and spent the rest of his years hating God and trying to drink himself into oblivion every day. Meanwhile, this little girl who had been named Aggie 
was adopted by a missionary couple. They eventually took her three years later back to America to live with them. She grew up, she went to school, went to a church school, church college, met a nice young man who was studying for ministry and they decided to go into ministry together. Some years later, Aggie read an article in a foreign language uh, magazine and the article caught her attention. Did I say she read it? She looked at it. <laughs> she couldn't read it. And in the article there was a picture of a white cross in Zaire and on the name of the cross was, sorry, on, on the cross was the name Sire Flood. This really piqued her interest. So she had the article translated. It told a story of missionaries who had travelled to Ndolera, Africa, many years before. A baby had been born, but the young mother had died soon after giving birth, having influenced just one small African boy for faith in Jesus. The missionaries left and the boy grew up. As a young man, he, he felt a sense of calling to establish a school. So he went to the village chief and pleaded for permission to build a school. The chief permitted him to do this. And at the school, the young man uh, won all of his students to faith in Jesus. And they went home and told their parents what they'd been learning. And their parents came to faith as well, including the village chief. Today, there are 600 believers in that village, all because of the sacrifice of David and Sire Flood. Their daughter Aggie and her husband took a trip to Sweden. That's where her roots were after all. That's where her parents came from. And she hoped to catch up with her father while there. She met her stepbrothers and a stepsister. And they shared with her the sad fate of their father. He was a drunken, embittered, 73-year-old man, but he was still alive. So Aggie decided to go and see him. She wanted to tell him the story of the African boy in Zaire that they had witnessed to. She did tell the story to her father. He was so moved by it that his faith was rekindled and he came back to the Lord. Sometime later again, Aggie and her husband attended meetings in London where they heard a talk given by a man who was the superintendent of a national church in Zaire. He said he represented 110,000 believers. Aggie, Aggie determined to try to speak to him after the meeting. She wanted to ask him whether he'd heard of David and Sire Flood. He said, Sire Flood, she was the one who led me to Christ. I was the boy who brought food to your parents before you were born. To this day, your mother's grave and her memory are honoured by all of us. I thought that was a good story. The little sermon I have for you this morning I've called Silencing the Son of David. Have you ever had the experience of being shushed? Saying something that people didn't want to hear? If you've been around a church for long, I'm sure you have. Asking too many questions or worse still, expressing unorthodox views could bring on a very good round of shushing. It happened to John the Baptist, to the Apostle Paul, to the deacon Stephen. In fact, most of the leading apostles of Jesus were silenced prematurely. Jesus didn't come to support the status quo. He was on a mission to shake up complacent religious people and to prepare them for his radical upside-down kingdom, the basic principles of which 
are found in Matthew 5, 6 and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. The people who heard that sermon had not heard such things before. And they started following Jesus wherever he went, wondering what he might say or do next. Matthew 8 in my Bible is a single page. On that one page is recorded an unprecedented round of activity. A leper healed. A Roman officer's servant restored. Peter's mother-in-law cured of a fever. And when the day ended, the calls just kept coming. Reading from Matthew 8, 16, that evening many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. He cast out the evil spirits with a simple command and he healed all the sick. But he wasn't finished yet. The chapter goes on to describe a lake crossing, a violent storm, the calming of the wind and the waves, the equally miraculous calming of the storms in the lives of two demon-possessed men. And then, of course, the sequel, an unnatural stampede of a large herd of pigs, which all drowned in the lake. This, of course, represented a terrible loss for the pig owners. Jesus was not to them a benefactor, and they urged him to leave. If he stayed on, they'd be completely ruined. The pig farmers were not the only ones who saw Jesus as a threat. And perhaps the saddest verse in all of scripture is John 1 verse 10. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. The custodians of the Old Testament legacy had lost the vision. Their religion had been reduced to a set of cultural forms and rules about what good people could and could not do. Orthodoxy had almost wrung the life out of what should have been a vibrant community. And into this decaying corpse dropped a man whose words and actions bespoke authority. The people liked what they heard and hungered for more. But the religious leaders were alarmed. This maverick new teacher was a threat to their public influence. Everything Jesus did had the ring of authority. His words were delivered with authority. <clears throat> he cast out demons with authority. His miracles of healing announced his spiritual authority. Well, they'd show him who had authority. They determined to use their formal authority to silence him. Matthew's Gospel presents a series of vignettes in which Jesus interacted with the religious leaders of the day. The first one we find in Matthew chapter 9. This was quite early in Jesus' ministry. It was before he even had 12 disciples. We see in Matthew 9 the calling of Matthew. Scene 1, chapter 9 starts with the healing of a paralyzed man. <clears throat> but before healing him, Jesus said something quite explosive. Mark tells the story in a more colourful way, Mark chapter 2. Mark 2 describes the crush at the house where Jesus was operating. So that it was such a crush, a crush that the man's friends were forced to carry him up onto the roof of the house, dig a hole in the roof, not just lift a few tiles, but actually dig a hole, and lower him at Jesus' feet. How's that for queue jumping? Imagine the disruption. Here is Jesus addressing the people and doing whatever he's doing, and suddenly, from the roof, we see a litter and a man reclining on it. Jesus, however, was unfazed. Touched by the faith of the man and his friends, Jesus said, Be encouraged, my child. Your sins are forgiven. That was the explosive bit. 
mouths fell open. That's blasphemy. Does he think he's God? What an ironic question. As I said before, this was an early encounter. These religious leaders hadn't yet developed a strategy for dealing with this populist upstart. And they weren't ready for his questions. And he had one. Why do you have such evil thoughts in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say stand up and walk? They missed the point. Notice the two judgments implied here. First, the paralytic was worthy of forgiveness. How did Jesus know that? One reason. The man had come for help. Anybody who comes to Jesus for help qualifies for that help. Second, <clears throat> Jesus recognised the evil intentions in the hearts of those religious lawmen. Matthew says Jesus knew what they were thinking. He read their hearts. Here in this place we see side by side a disabled man eager to be made whole and a bunch of religious hypocrites just as eager to prevent it. Is there another one that, oh, we're back again. Thank you. Where was I? Let me prove to you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Turning to the paralyzed man, Jesus spoke three brief commands. Stand up, pick up your mat, go home. The man didn't just stand up, he jumped up. He jumped up and went home. Now there's not much to see if someone's forgiven. But a miracle of healing is highly visible. It would be talked about for days, weeks, months, in fact thousands of years to come. Here we are 2,000 years later rehearsing this story again. The teachers had been shown up. Jesus didn't give them an argument about his authority. He showed them authority in action. His logic was unanswerable. Scene two. Next day it was the Pharisees' turn. They attacked Jesus by accusing his disciples of Sabbath breaking. Matthew 12 verse 2. Look, your disciples are breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath. Do you think Jesus' disciples were the first Jews to ever do that? I doubt it. Nevertheless, their harvesting triggered an attack. Without hesitating, Jesus defended them. He didn't let the attackers get away with it. Haven't you read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God and he and his companions broke the law by eating the sacred loaves that only the priests were supposed to eat. And haven't you read in the law of Moses that the priests on duty in the temple may work on the Sabbath day? I tell you, there's one here who is even greater than the temple. Then Jesus quoted to them Hosea 6 verse 6. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. And he ended by boldly declaring himself Lord of the Sabbath. The Pharisees had no reply, but they didn't give up. There'd be other opportunities to charge him with Sabbath breaking. Scene three, they follow him into the synagogue and watch closely as he pauses beside a man with a, a deformed hand. Now this man had not asked for healing. He was just standing there. And perhaps he was nervous about the posse of Pharisees stalking the healer. They had a question for Jesus. Does the law permit a person to work 
by healing on the Sabbath, Matthew 2 verse 10. They doubted Jesus would say no, and if he said yes, they'd have him. Would Jesus fall for their trap? Well, he had a question for them. If you had a sheep that fell into a well on the Sabbath, wouldn't you work to pull it out? Of course you would. And how much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Yes, the law permits a person to do good on the Sabbath. Jesus had answered their, uh, their challenge by enlarging the context. Hadn't it occurred to the Pharisees that people were more important than animals? Again, Jesus had outwitted them. Frustrated and angry, they called a meeting. That's what people do when they don't know what to do. They call a meeting. And when the best plans of bullies and despots fail, they resort to force. Jesus would have to be silenced. So they watch Jesus closely searching for a weakness. Meanwhile, he continued to walk confidently, speak with authority, and embarrass them with all of his miracles of healing. Next, he healed a man who really had serious issues. He was blind. He couldn't see. He was mute. He couldn't talk. And he was demon-possessed, Matthew 12, verse 22. Three pretty serious problems, not one, but three. How could they possibly find fault with a triple, a triple miracle? Well, of course they did. Yet all of these losing encounters were destroying the logic of the Pharisees. Notice their response to the, to the exorcism, Matthew 12, 24, where they said, no wonder he casts out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. What a desperate claim. Jesus answered saying, if Satan is casting out Satan, he is divided and he's, he's fighting against himself. His kingdom can't possibly survive. And if I'm empowered by Satan, what about your own exorcists? They cast out demons too. They'll condemn you for what you've said. But if I'm casting out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. But this they refused to acknowledge. Scene five. Question. How did Jesus relate to tradition? Well, he had no use for it if it created injustice. To add a bit of weight, the Pharisees and teachers of the law combined forces for this attack. Uh, Matthew 15 verse 2. Why do your disciples disobey our age-old tradition? For they ignore the tradition of ceremonial hand-washing before they eat. Tradition, of course, is hard to ignore. It can assume the force of doctrine. It can control behaviour. It can stifle questioning. We see it in the church today. Tradition is our bulwark against ordaining women. Jesus replied, Matthew 15, verse 3, And why do you, by your tradition, violate the direct commandment of God? For instance, God says, Honour your father and mother. And anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. But you say it's all right for people to say to their parents, Sorry, I can't help you. For I have vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. In this way you say you don't need to honour your parents. And so you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you and said, For these people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made rules as the commands of God. Scene 6. 
Earlier, the Pharisees had accused Jesus of performing miracles with the help of demons. They'd been pretty blunt and direct about it. This time, they'd try a different approach. They begin instead by flattering him, softening him up before they lobbed their grenade. It was a clever trap, a real catch-22 or so it seemed. It would force Jesus to incriminate himself. Matthew 22, verse 16, Teacher, we know how honest you are. You teach the way of God truthfully. You're impartial. You don't play favourites. Now, tell us what you think about this. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Boom. Wriggle out of that one if you can. Heal a man. You can almost hear them smirking. Jesus read their evil thoughts. Why are you trying to trap me? Here, show me the coin used to pay the tax. They hand him a coin. Whose picture and title are stamped on it? The Pharisees replied, Caesar's, of course. Where was he going with this? Jesus said, well then, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. I've always marveled at the simple logic of this reply. Even when I was a small boy, I remember hearing this story and thinking, wow, I wouldn't have thought of that. Imagine their chagrin. Their catch-22 proved to be a squib after all. Scene 7. Finally, the priests and elders got together to mount a united attack. Matthew 21, 23, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you the right? Jesus, of course, wasn't a product of the rabbinical schools. He had no mentor, no official accreditation, no PhD. It's interesting to note that in John's Gospel, Jesus answers a similar question by claiming the authority of God. Matthew doesn't tell the story that way. Yes, uh, John, in John 10 verse 30, uh, he says, the Father and I are one. But John doesn't, uh, Matthew doesn't report it this way. Here's how Matthew reports it in uh, Matthew 21. I'll tell you by what authority I do these things if you answer one question. Did John's authority to baptise come from heaven or was it merely human. Now this was a real catch-22. The priests and elders went into a huddle. After a feverish consultation, they gave a political answer in verse 27. We don't know. What they meant was, we lack the courage to tell you what we really think. We're too afraid of the people. This, of course, gave Jesus the opportunity to reject their question then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. A masterful response. If this had been a boxing match, the scorecard would show that Jesus' opponents had not landed a single punch. They'd been beating the air. Jesus, on the other hand, hadn't missed once. And they were punch drunk. A divine mind was at work and they were no match for it. If only they knew how much that divine mind loved them. If only they knew his deep desire to rescue them from themselves and their folly. One last scene, scene eight. At the end, Jesus had a question for them. Matthew 22, verse 42. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? Eagerly, the Pharisees responded, he is the son of David. This answer played right into Jesus' hands. And he replied by quoting David to them from Psalm 110 verse 1. Then why does David, speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit, call the Messiah my Lord? For David said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honour at my right hand until I humble your enemies beneath your feet. 
Since David called Messiah my Lord, how can the Messiah be his son? Even the disciples didn't understand this. Again, they had no answer. Matthew says, after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. They'd have to silence him. But crucifying Jesus didn't shore up their authority for very long. A generation later, the Romans sacked Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and ended the Jewish state. By contrast, what Jesus started became a mountain that filled the earth, explaining our presence here this morning. Matthew ends his gospel with Jesus asserting his authority. Matthew 28, 19, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is Jesus' charge to us this morning. We're invited to accept the authority of the Holy Spirit into our lives. Not only does he want us to be his disciples, he wants us to be disciple makers. And when this gospel of the kingdom has been preached in all the world, the end will come.